The medieval version of Norwich was defended on its north, south and west sides by high flint walls like this one. In this short documentary, we will be discovering the why behind these walls. We start off by talking to someone who knows their way around Norwich history. I want to see Colin Howey, a Norwich historian from the Norwich Castle Museum, to get some answers. So Colin, why were these walls created, do you know? Well, I think the obvious thing people would think of is defence, but I don't actually think that's the main reason for it. There's several. One is that at this period in time, in the sort of late 13th century into the 14th century, the city is making a bid for independence. And one way of doing that is to literally mark its territory as separate from the rest of the county. And so it's a statement, it's a statement of independence and power. And then of course there is defence as well, that's an obvious thing. But the truth of the matter is, is that the Norwich City Wall compared to say the Yarmouth Town Wall was not that impressive defensively and it had an open section facing the river as well. What kind of people were involved in the construction of the walls? Well, there's lots of people we would never know about, just ordinary people who physically were in effect press ganged into doing the labouring and the building. Then of course there are the masons and the carpenters who were involved in the construction. And the carpenters were particularly important because most of the city walls were flint rubble. So they would have built the shuttering as it was called that you then infilled with the rubble. What kind of battles or experiences did these walls go through in their lifetimes? I'd love to know all the experiences, I'm sure they saw some sights, but the things that we can know about is two big events really, 1381, the Peasants' Revolt, but we don't know any detail about that. But what we do know more about is Ket's Rebellion of 1549, where between 15 to 25,000 people, angry people, came to protest against enclosures um, in Norwich and they surrounded the city. And after, I'm not going to go into all the background, but basically they ended up attacking the city walls and won control of the city at that point. So what kind of things were the gates used for? And they were definitely used as pest houses and the way we know is because of accountants because money was being spent to look after them and to confine them and there's accounts that show that. Yeah. And the other thing that um, they were used for sometimes informally was as kind of informal asylums, for, if you like, or for containing people who were deemed to be insane. And at, in the medieval period, one of the beliefs was, was that if you were deemed to be mad, that you would be confined in darkness, which seems kind of counter to what I would expect. I think I would lose my reason. So what kind of legacy did the walls leave? One, one of them is the, the, the discussion and debates and battles to some extent over whether it should be valued or not. And as late as the 1970s, there were still proposals to demolish sections of the wall. For instance, the piece down Chapel Field that looks like an old broken tooth. The um, local councillors were arguing that why should we spend money conserving this when there's things like um, old people's homes that we've got to pay for. So there's a debate there and there probably will be into the future. And I, I raised the question, what is the value of this heritage. For me, it's loads of things. It connects us to our past, it brings in tourism, it makes us reflect on how we build and what we value. And so there's so many different aspects to it. From all of the evidence we've been able to document over the years, it seems that these walls began their lives in 1294 and were fully functional by the middle of the 14th century. The town had expanded and needed bigger and better defences to protect its residents and of course to keep out any unwanted visitors and animals too. These walls were originally made from flint, but brick and stone was also used to reinforce the angles of the walls. This reduced breaching, gave support for doorways, arrow loops and crenellations too. Each section of wall had towers at regular intervals, with wall walks on the top to make it easier for archers and soldiers to walk across them and between them. This one here is the cow tower. This one actually defended the waterfront, instead of actually defending the town. Most of the walls had ditches on the outer side in order to make breaching more difficult, but I'm pretty sure on this side it was big enough. In the 19th century, the ditches were filled in and some of the walls were destroyed for building materials as Norwich needed to expand, leaving us with the walls we have today. Although the walls were a great defensive element, on the east side of the city there were actually none built for the simple reason it was defended by the river. The only way across was by Bishop's Bridge that is currently beneath my feet. 
This bridge was defended by a gatehouse on its west side, just behind me. The gatehouses, boom towers and the cow tower managed all the deliveries coming into Norwich. This was simple enough, as the towers were always watching and all of the keys were inside the city's perimeter. At one point, there were 11 gateways entering each angle of Norwich. Because of the gates and the fact that there were giant walls everywhere, made it very easy to control the supplies and goods that came to Norwich at any given time. These walls provided general security for all the residents in Norwich and were also a similar power. Back here, there used to be a gate, but unfortunately, in 1793, it was destroyed to encourage trade throughout Norwich. There are only 16 pieces of old Norwich wall defences left today. From east to west, they are as follows. There are two boom towers either side of the river underneath Carrow Bridge, alongside with a small wall section. Just across the road on Carrow Hill, there are two towers with quite a large section of wall going up the side of the hill. On Queen's Road, leading up to Chapelfield, there is a small wall segment that has an enclosed piece you can walk into. Just in front of Chapelfield, travelling the same way, there is a long section of wall that has become three separate pieces over the years, and in front of Chapelfield Gardens, there is a tower too. On the roundabout that links to Convent Road, there is a small segment of the bottom half of the wall in the middle. On Barn Road, either side of the junction, there are two segments of short wall that have mostly formed the pieces. Moving across the river, on Baker's Road, there is a low segment of wall that has crumbled into pieces over the years. There is a tall section of wall across the road, here. Hidden away at Anglia Square, there is another segment of wall. It is currently in a construction site, so cannot be viewed by the public. Eastward is a small section of wall and a tower on Bull Close Road. The last section of wall that survives today is just off of Barrack Street. It is behind a car park and hidden away so I recommend going to see any of the other walls before this one. Last but not least, there is a tower sitting by itself at the top of Norwich by the river called the Cow Tower. The old walls had been modified up to the 18th century, but ever since then they have become a part of Norwich's iconic features, like the castle behind me. We have only taken a quick glance at these walls today, but I hope you've learned something or just simply enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.